Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Jeff Tate, the CEO of FlexLogic, who's going to talk today about how to increase the density of an embedded FPGA to the point where it's at the same density as a regular FPGA. Jeff, one of the big promises of an embedded FPGA is it can shrink down to any node that you want it to because it's really just embedded as code inside another chip, right? Uh, yes, we do an IP design, and that IP design we deliver to our customer, and they can integrate it into their chip. Actually, they can integrate it multiple times and have different embedded FPGAs in different parts of the chip. And this can be at seven nanometers, five nanometers. That's not really the determining factor, right? It's just this is whatever the, the chip node is going to be, whatever the density is going to be, however many uh, max you need, that's all adjustable with an embedded FPGA. What, so what the customers want is they want their node, their foundry, their metal stack on their schedule. And if we can't meet that, there's no embedded FPGA market. So that was the big challenge when we started the company, because traditionally with FPGAs, there's a cast of hundreds, and it takes them three years to do an FPGA. If that's how we did embedded FPGAs, we could never deliver on time, and it wouldn't be economic. So why don't you draw this out for us, Jeff? Sure. So Jeff, what are we looking at here? This, what we're looking at here is a very crude representation of uh, today's leading FPGAs. FPGAs. If you look in at the silicon, there is a outer ring of phis, DDR, PCIe, SIRDs, and so forth. High-speed IOs, very analogy. Inside is the digital programmable logic. But what I didn't realize when I first met Chen, my co-founder, is that the programmable logic is actually just 20% of the silicon area in FPGA. The XY grid, like Manhattan style grid that connects it all, takes 80% of the silicon area in the FPGAs today that you get from people like Xilinx and Altera. So, how does this compare to an ASIC? An ASIC has hardwired connections, they're typically buses. And, and that means that you may have multiple blocks on the bus, and two blocks can communicate at any given time, but the other blocks are idle. In an FPGA, you're able to connect all of the compute elements to any other compute element directly, but that means you need a lot more of the silicon area for interconnect. So it gives you more flexibility, more programmability, but they're at a cost. Can you integrate what you develop in an EFPGA into the ASIC hardwire infrastructure? Yes, because we're a standalone building block that they hook up to with their buses. And as a result of that, you've improved your speed, you've improved your density potentially, and you've also improved the uh, power utilization of that FPGA too, right? Well, compared to using an FPGA chip, because the power in an FPGA, probably half of it is in the high-speed I.O. If you integrate into the FPGA into the ASIC, you get rid of all of the high-speed surges and the latency that they take, and the silicon area, for that matter. But where I was going with this, Ed, was that when, when I met Chen, he told me he had a better way to make an FPGA. He could do the interconnect in much less silicon area. And that's the key to our embedded FPGA business. And the interconnect, there, there's a whole uh, hierarchy of interconnects that go into a chip, right? So where does this one fit? Well, in an FPGA, there is traditionally an XY grid, Manhattan style, streets and avenues, and we won't draw it all out. In a real FPGA, this is replicated with thousands of wires in north, south, and east, west directions. And there's a lookup table at each of these blocks, and there's muxes. And let's say there's a lookup table down here, and there's muxes. And at each of these intersections, there's muxes. So you can think of this as if you want to go from lot A to lot B, you get there by selecting the mux paths to take you through these connections into, into the other lot. But now that wiring channel is taken for that signal. 
these signals are not multiplexed in an FPGA. So your next LUT down here, if it's trying to talk to a LUT over here, you know, it's, it selects the muxes like something like this. And this is very simplistic. It gets much more complicated and traditional FPGAs have uh, you know, short interconnects and long interconnects, but basically it's a mesh grid. And the problem with the mesh grid is that the area required grows with n squared. And what Chen had come up with was an interconnect that takes less area and where the complexity does not grow exponentially. And that means when I met him, he said, I can make a smaller FPGA. And that's been one of the big problems with FPGAs, right? Is they're generally very large chips, which is one of the reasons that we started seeing advanced packaging through an interposer first in the FPGA. The yield was just uh, significantly lower than it was on a, on a chip that size. Well, they are large chips. Um, you know, there's a lot of large chips out there these days, but a lot of customers are very happy with them because they can do things with FPGAs that they can't do any other way. But if you can make it smaller, it'd be pretty cool. But what I told Chen when I first met him is, okay, suppose you can make it smaller. I believe you. After talking with him, he struck me like he was pretty smart. So if you can make the interconnect 80%, from 80%, if you can cut that in half, maybe you can make an FPGA that's half the size of Xilinx. The only trouble if you're a, if you're a startup is your die size, if it's half, it, that doesn't determine your price, it's your die size and your wafer price. And if you're a startup, your wafer price as a startup is probably gonna be a lot higher than Xilinx. They don't, they don't teach that in PhD school. <laughs> so we would give up our area advantage because of a wafer cost disadvantage. And we would have to, to get this density, we'd have to do full custom design like, a, like the FPGA guys do. And full custom design is the old fashioned way of carving transistors at a very low level of detail. It's kind of like writing assembler code instead of C code. You know, you can do it, but hardly anybody does anymore. And uh, so the business strategy of trying to make FPGA chips wouldn't work. But what we brainstormed on is, well, maybe could we be the arm of FPGA and do digital FPGA cores, which we can put into other people's chips. Uh, when ARM started, the idea of processors as blocks inside an SOC was, was fairly weird. And it took them some time to get adoption, but of course now ARM is everywhere. And that's what we set out to see if we could do. Are the interconnects on this reconfigurable? So can you dynamically reconfigure them? Is it that fast or is it a slow and uh, uh, very cautious process? In today's FPGAs, you can, you can reconfigure, but Nobody really cares about dynamic reconfigurability. You know, you, you tend to optimize chips for what people want. You know, if people want, uh, you know, low cost airfare, you end up with coach class 12, 12 seats across. <laughs> uh, you know, if people optimize and give the market what they want. So with FPGAs today, most applications for FPGAs are you boot up, you load the FPGA, to run whatever you're going to run, and it runs that all the time. And every now and then, maybe once a month, every three months, every six months, kind of like your phone gets software updates, you, you know, you tweak the FPGA code for the application. So there is no high speed reconfigurable FPGA that you can buy today. So let's drill down into this a little bit, Jeff. How does this work for an embedded FPGA versus a, a standard FPGA? The FPGA guys, when they do a chip, like Xilinx, let's pick Xilinx, his is a leader. They do a great job and they're selling lots of these parts. When they, when they do a new family, they study and they pick a foundry, TSMC7, they're typically the first people on that node because they've got such a need for density, large chips and, and high, high levels of metal, metal layers. 
And they spend something like three years with probably around 100 people to do an FPGA design because it's full custom. So as a startup, you know, we even today, after a lot of growth, have 40 people. So we don't have the team to do even one full custom design. But we today have embedded FPGA available on 180 nanometers, 40 nanometers, 28 nanometers, 16 nanometers, and we're working on seven. So how do we do it with a small team? The first thing is we do standard cells. And that's how most SOCs get designed today. You know, people who design SOCs generally do not do full custom anymore. And now we're talking about embedded FPGA. And the reason we do standard cells is we could do a smaller embedded FPGA because our interconnect would be smaller, but it would take too long and it would cost too much. If we use standard cells, which are readily available for foundries at no cost, are already proven and you snap them together like Lego blocks, we can build an embedded FPGA that has area and speed equal to an FPGA. Now our ratio of interconnect and LUTs is different. Remember our interconnect is twice the density of theirs. So imagine this 20% stays the same, this 80% becomes 40%. So the ratio for us is like one third of the area is LUTs and Two thirds is interconnect. So it's still a significant amount, but we're using standard cells, which are double the size of full custom. And the reason we're able to get away with it is that Chen came up with a revolutionary interconnect while he was at UCLA. And he has improved on that interconnect since he's been at FlexLogix, and there's like four or five patents now on this interconnect. And, and this interconnect takes half the silicon area of traditional FPGA interconnect. It takes half of the metal layers, which is important because we can be compatible now with any metal stack. Uh, and it's just as good in terms of speed and density, maybe better on the density or the utilization side. So we've been looking at some of these designs for that are getting really complicated. And this is a piece of a very complicated design. How many people does it actually take to do this? How long does it take to roll one of these out the door? So traditional FPGAs, it's something like 100 plus people in about three years. For us, it's less than 10 people and it is measured in the range of six to eight months from start to delivery of the GDS and all of the timing files, uh, all of the test factors ready to be integrated into the SOC. So, so this, this is critical because this means that we can charge an amount for this design that's relatively affordable. And a customer can call us up and say, hey, I'm taping out next year. And if, if they get going on it with us this year, we can deliver to them in time before they tape out. This strategy allows us to meet the economic needs of the market and the schedule needs of the market and put FPGA all over the place. And when you think about it, you know, there's like five plus major foundries these days and they've got 180, and they've got 90, and they've got 60, and they've got, you count up all the nodes, you know, it's something like, you know, 10 plus nodes. So, you know, you're talking about 50 or more different embedded FPGAs will eventually be needed to populate this universe. So although there's a lot of FPGA available from us and some from our competitors, uh, there's still a lot more what we call porting of embedded FPGA to go to cover all the process nodes that will eventually be needed. And one of the other things that initially came out with the embedded FPGAs um, is that they're very adaptable when you have to deal with new algorithms, new uh, protocols are coming out in the marketplace. This allows you to build an ASIC and also build in some of that flexibility as well, right? Yeah. Well, there's. There's, there's several people, reasons people use 
embedded FPGA. The, the most obvious one is there's people who use FPGAs today and for various reasons, they want to integrate the FPGA. One reason is to reduce area. Another reason is to reduce power. Another reason is to reduce cost. And it can be some mix. Um, and a, a, a fourth reason is to fabricate in the United States, which is a driver behind a lot of our business with the US uh, uh, Defense uh, Department. The second reason to use FPGA is for ASIC companies who don't use FPGA at all today. And what they want is they want to get some flexibility into their chip where they can change algorithms and adapt to different protocols uh, using embedded FPGA. And the third reason is that embedded FPGA can be very fast for doing certain workloads like encryption faster than a processor. So if they do a lot of encryption, putting an embedded FPGA block on there to dedicate it to do that task can make the whole chip faster and smaller than it otherwise would have been. Jeff Tate, thanks as always for a great explanation. Ed, appreciate it. Great talking to you again.